and it looks like we are live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this panel discussion titled New Advancements in Psychedelic Integration. Um, quick introduction to the talk before we get rolling here. Um, Mapping the Mind is an annual psychedelic science conference that aims to raise funds and awareness and support of psychedelic research. This year, proceeds from Mapping the Mind 2020 are being donated to MAPS Canada and will help fund a study on psychedelic therapy for eating disorders. Eating disorders are among the most challenging mental disorders to treat. Furthermore, mortality rates for anorexia nervosa are the highest of any psychiatric disorder. That blew my mind when I read that last night. Traditional treatments for eating disorders are relatively ineffective, and there is a growing evidence that psychedelic assisted therapy could be effective in treating this population. This phase two study led by Dr. Adele LaFrance will look at the potential of MDMA assisted psychotherapy to treat anorexia nervosa and bulimia. And it will have three sites, two in Canada, Toronto and Vancouver, and one in Denver. I'd like to visit, at least talk to those folks. And uh, conference attendees will be able to donate directly to support this study through Crowdcast using the donate button at the bottom of the screen. Um, after the discussion, there will be a Q&A and you could submit your questions using the ask a question button. You move your mouse around, you'll probably find that. So hi everybody, I'm Joe Moore, your uh, moderator for today's discussion. Um, I help run Psychedelics Today, a great education uh, company and podcast. And let's start digging into who's joining us today. I'll kind of maybe go alphabetically here. Um, we have Don DeCuna from Toronto, a um, clinical psychologist working with Compass. Uh, I'm so excited to have you here. We've got Deanna Rogers with loads of experience at the Temple of the Way of Light uh, coming in from Vancouver. And Lauren Taus, I didn't realize this, but you have a license in New York and California. Um, and you've been doing ketamine assisted psychotherapy for a long time and uh, have the MAPS training for uh, MDMA assisted psychotherapy, which is lovely. And Robin, hi Robin, coming in from Ontario, usually in Toronto. and. Uh, you've founded Rise Wellness Retreats, and I'm excited to get to know you here on this panel. All right. Um, so, so we have an interesting topic, psychedelic integration. When we talk about this on Psychedelics Today, it's uh, nearly an endless topic. I don't really know that we can exhaust this well. Um, but let's let's take a stab at it. Does anybody have like, well, let's put this out there. What's your what's your best definition of psychedelic integration? If if we can take a really quick stab at it, anybody's uh, up. For me, the best integration happens when the fruits of uh, your journey become evident in your activities of daily living and your day to day life changes. Mm, I like that. At least noticing your rewards. Yeah. Thank you, Don. Anybody else want to take a stab at it? <laughs> it's okay if you don't. Like it's a it's a really alien difficult topic. Could be the aliens. They have something to say that is it me? Am I echoing? Okay, I think we're okay. Um, so another way that uh, I like to describe psychedelic integration is you know in a way comparable i think to to dream work uh, a psychedelic experience can be this very beautiful fleeting moment that happens and then you can easily also forget about it or it just be that just one fleeting moment whereas if you can integrate that experience as don has mentioned into your daily practices into your day-to-day -day life that's when the aspects that may have been kind of shown within that uh, trip within that experience can actually be a tool to, to help you improve your day to day. I think that strange sound might be coming from me when I when I when I Yeah, I think it was you. Yeah, I just um I don't know if any of you have seen this uh, Dr. Chris Bache's new book uh, LSD in the Mind of the Universe where he did a 20 something year project and um, at the end of the book, he doesn't think he's ever going to really integrate his experiences in his lifetime. So there's something about pacing as well. Um, like we can't necessarily drink 
thousands of times <laughs> and expect to integrate that. Um, maybe we can, but perhaps that's pushing the boundaries of the human um, experience a little bit much. Yeah, so, I, um, I can add something, Joe, before we move on. Um, for me, it's it's also a lifestyle. I think that kind of willingness to look at kind of what's coming up. And so I think that, you know, these these medicines open us up and connect us to kind of a lot more of our, you know, what's there for us, what comes in the dream space, what comes in our life. And I think it's about um, having the kind of openness and tools and support, hopefully, you know, to work with that. And so there is the kind of medicine experience, but then there's also kind of all these ripples that happen in our life afterwards. And so I think it's about staying curious and alive with that, with that process. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'm kind of curious, um, since you've spent so much time with ayahuasca, but like a lot of the discussion right now is around MDMA, psilocybin, ketamine, are you noticing a difference in the way that experiences need to be integrated um, by different drugs or plants? Uh, me personally, or just anyone? You can go first. <laughs> okay, sure. Um yeah, this is, I mean, this is something I'm curious about as well. I think that we're kind of, this is all being discovered. It's like pretty real time. Um, I think one of the differences between kind of these more um, plant medicine based uh, medicines is that they have a, a spirit to them. And so there's a, usually a process where people will, it's, I don't know how many times I've heard like, okay, this entity came in my dreams, I felt like it was ayahuasca, or even with psilocybin, you know, I think that there's kind of a relationship that can develop. And so I think the integration process can be a little bit different based on that. Um, but ultimately, I think the essence is similar, you know, I think it's really about, okay, how do we connect with what's there, I think these medicines work slightly differently in terms of how they work. Uh, I haven't personally worked with ketamine. Um, but you know, it's a horse tranquilizer. <laughs> That's what it was initially. And then it's like, okay, well, how does that differentiate from something that's like uh, ayahuasca, which is very much about kind of feeling what's there. Um, and ketamine kind of creates some space around it to maybe not, it has a, a different element to it. So I think that the medicines work in a different way. Um, and I think that that can impact integration somewhat, but at the, at the core, I feel like it's about, you know, this quest for wholeness and connecting to what's there and what's real and what's been pushed away um, because of our upbringing for different reasons, culturally, our personal histories, our family dynamics. So. Mm. so here's uh, one of the questions that the uh, team put together, and I think this is an interesting one. Um, it's about... Um, personal experience as like a facilitator. I know this isn't necessarily specifically around like client integration, but um, how do you all feel about the, uh, psychedelic assisted therapists, like um, having a psychedelic experience before going in and working with clients? Like in the, in the holotropic breathwork world, there's like a full two year period where you're doing your own work. Um, and I think this is kind of common in a lot of traditions, but I don't know how common it is, you know, outside that world. Anybody have any thoughts on that topic? I think um, if I may contribute, I think the, the context and the application uh, matters a great deal. If, you, if you're an individual that's been struggling with uh, mental health issues, either acute or chronically, then the reasons for you wanting to engage in a journey vary and your belief systems going in may vary and your preparation for the journey may vary and your medicine may vary. Um, so I think, uh, I, I think a lot has to do with the classical set and setting. What are the reasons that you come to the medicine? What are your expectations? What would you like? But you know, in terms of the, in terms of the integration, I will tell you, having trained at uh, CIIS in California, I've not had the MAPS training, though we did have training um, a little bit by MAPS. And I've also had training specifically for men addressing mental health issues, specifically in treatment resistant depression. And the model of integration is very, very different from my training as a psychologist. So 
I think it absolutely matters the training of the therapist um, and and the fit between the the person taking the journey. So context matters, set and setting matters. I think ultimately it comes down to to that. Different therapists are are very different um, in terms of their own experiences with the medicine and the different medicines. So it's very complex. You know, it's very complex. I I kind of like to think of you know, explore everything and let yourself be guided to what is a good fit for you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Robin, do you have any thoughts on that? Like if people should have their own experience before facilitating? Yeah, for sure. I mean, of course I can't say that, you know, a therapist has to have that experience. Um, but there are also, aside from taking, taking the, the plant medicines you can do, as you mentioned, holotropic breath work to at least, have some kind of understanding as to what an altered state of consciousness is. I would be, you know, I'd be curious to encounter somebody who's in this field who has resistance to having an altered state experience and wants to facilitate and wants to lead something like that. I'd be, I'd be very curious to, to have a conversation just as to, you know, as to the why. And I would kind of equate it to you know, a camp counselor taking a group of kids through the woods, you would hope that that counselor has been through those woods, knows that terrain. Do they absolutely have to have that experience? No, I'm sure they can get you through, but I think there's a lot lost if they, if they maybe have not had that experience themselves. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We were <laughs> at horizons this year trying to come up with a good argument. Like how do we like make an argument that's so good we can convince regulators, you know, like, cause it's easy to convince each other. It's not so easy to convince a regulator. Um, Deanna, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I feel pretty. <laughs> oh, I think someone's not muted. Maybe there's an echo. Um, I, I feel quite strongly about this one. And I think it's also because of a lot of my training actually comes from a more traditional lineage. And so, you know, I've studied a lot. I've done a lot of traditional study with Shipibos and also with the Tibet ghetto. Um, and so for me, kind of, maybe once again, this is different for people working with MDMA and ketamine, but you know, there's something about the fact when you're with someone in these experiences, knowing that, you know, even just in the integration process, when someone's trying to unpack it, you know, I have so many clients that go to regular therapists afterwards and they're like, they don't get it. <laughs> there's just something missing not having that experiential piece. And I feel strongly about it. Um, and there's something about knowing those states for yourself and knowing also that someone can get through it and that it will pass and that, you know, okay, it may mean that, you know, this is, if someone's ever talking to me about preparation, I'm like, are you willing for things to fall apart? And to know that, okay, you may be on a one, two, three year journey if you sign up to do this deep work. Um, but having that confidence and that knowing that, yes, this can pass and it will pass, I think, um, you know, comes from that experiential level. And I, I echo Robin, it's like, I would get very curious <laughs> what's there for them if they have that resistance to working with it. And I think also just like that empathetic connection to what their, their patients are going through um, is really important. And I would say, um, you know, not even just trying it once, I would say to have a, a deep relationship with a, with a medicine and, you know, I, I can't say that that's the only way to do it, but that's, you know, for me, what feels right, what feels true. And any traditional study of these medicines, you know, you study for as long as a, a doctor. You know, I have years of diets or dietas, kind of the traditional study, but I'm nowhere near to wanting to give ayahuasca to people or, um, and so I, I just think that once again, if we take kind of these more traditional elements of it, there's a, there's a huge thing to be learned there. Yeah, it's super valuable. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so much depth there. I could probably talk to you for about six hours on that particular line of thought there. <laughs> um, Lauren, do you want to maybe comment? So in running around with trying to find the volume and everything, I lost track of the questions. My apologies, everybody, for the technical difficulties. For me, one of the things that's very front of mind is that when we're talking about integration, we're also talking about disintegration. And what is being dissolved in a way to expand a person's aperture. 
and allow them access to different parts of themselves, which may have been previously hidden or out of, out of range. And often these parts are like such beautiful treasures. And the in, like, there's sort of this disintegration in order to learn and then integration. And as a practitioner that works pretty much every day of the week with ketamine, I, I want to say that number one, I had so much judgment towards ketamine before I understood it. And there's often a conversation between the plants and the compounds and a, and a sense of like, one is better than the other. And when any of these tools are worked with kindly and carefully and safely, they all have the ability to create profound transformational changes in a person's life. And in my heart, the, the hero's journey is always home. There's nothing broken in a person. This is about getting back to our own hearts, opening the gates of our hearts to, to ourselves, and in such a way that the only sensible contribution is, is, is a good one. So I, I, I'm very happy to kind of share more about ketamine or, or you know, integration as we go along, but jumping back into the conversation, these are a few kind of pieces that I immediately wanted to share. Great. And then Lauren, real quick, um, do you think it's important for a therapist to have personal experience um, before jumping in? A hundred gazillion, gazillion percent. I mean, it blows my mind that clinicians would even dare step into the field without their own personal experiences. They have no idea what's happening for their clients. And because these types of experiences are essentially like tutorials, like you have to know your own mechanism. Now, that doesn't mean that I can't support somebody who's had some life journey that I, I can't personally relate to. But with these tools, it's, it's outrageous to me to think that someone would pick them up and purport to understand what they do if they don't. And I have a number of clients who've come to me from clinics or other you know, places from doctors, providers who don't have personal experience. And that disconnect is something that is experienced in the treatment and is, is very uncomfortable for people. Right. It's an, it's an amazing conversation. Thank you for that, Lauren. Mm -hmm. um, now, this one is a question close to my heart. Um, and in an interesting way, it speaks to integration, right? We're, we're becoming kind of disintegrated from our roots in a lot of ways. So the question goes, in the Western world, our dominant cosmology is scientific materialism. How do you work with experiences engendered by psychedelics that may include vividly felt mythological and transpersonal elements including encounters with spirits and entities that do not easily fit into this prevailing worldview. What can Western society learn from ancient or older traditions regarding psychedelic integration? And um, I'd maybe like Deanna to kick that off because you, you kind of um, exist in this really interesting world um, out of Peru. Yeah, I just want to name, I'm not Shipibo, and so I'm not Indigenous, um, Canadian-born, um, but I can I can speak about my experiences and my, my time down there. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is one of the big, the big things, even the name of this, this conference is called Mapping the Mind, and these, you know, from a, what I learned in an Indigenous perspective, it's like we're working on the, the soul, on the mind, on the emotions, on the body, um, so even that, you know, threatens a lot of people's worldview in kind of a Western context. And so I think that the beauty of these medicines is that they can start to include that conversation, um, even though there might be a little bit resistance in some of the, the realms, you know, uh, around this. And so it's, um, yeah, it's always an interesting topic in terms of entities, because, you know, from the ayahuasca perspective, you diet with plants, you know, similar healers, you the same plant spirit in the same way. There's a lot of entities that are worked with kind of in that realm. Um, and I think it's kind of this, this loss of relationship to archetypes, to spirits, to the fact that you can go and, you know, connect with a tree or <laughs> talk with a tree. And I think that's what a lot of these, these kind of psychedelics start to break down. But then I think kind of the gap is, you know, culturally, we don't really have a way to talk about that outside of like organized religion. And, um, and that falls short a lot of the time. And so I think we're kind of, there's a, I feel like there's a really big need um, to kind of 
start to bridge these worlds. You know, okay, what does it mean? How can we start to talk about what it is to work with an entity? And even when I talked about, you know, how these these plant medicines have spirits, and I'm not saying they're the kind of best way, they're just what I what I know. Um, it's like we can start to have a relationship. And I think that holding is what can actually support people to process a lot of the things that they've pushed away or hidden from, as Lauren was talking about, because those are things that were painful and people had to disconnect from when they were younger. And so um, I think it's about, yeah, working with symbol, working with archetypes, working with something larger than yourself. Um, there's, yeah, I think this is a very long, we could have an hour and a half conversation about that, I think, but I'll, I'll start there. Cool, anybody else interested in jumping in on that question? Yeah, I might just uh, add a little bit to what Deanna had mentioned there. And, um, you know, in, in the conversation of working with the archetype specifically, um, what I've done in my practice is use the expressive arts as a way to explore this a little bit, because as we're all aware, you know, a lot of these experiences we can't quite put words to, it is ineffable. So if I can have somebody who is perhaps coming out of this experience, just put the images or the feelings down onto in a visual context, it may not make sense at that point, but I have had instances in which, you know, there's like some kind of uh, notes of the trickster or the mother archetype or whatever that might be for them. And then being able to explore that and involve that within the integration process itself. So I found, yeah, the expressive or the arts in general has been a really beautiful way of kind of uh, melding these worlds and being able to, yeah, to work with them. Great, thank you. Lauren? Joe, if I, if I may, oh, sorry, go ahead, Lauren. I was just going to add that I have, I have a wall in my home of art that clients have created out of their ketamine journeys. And every time I receive a piece, like many clients, I mean, I, I invite them to engage in this way, but their, their kind of willingness and initiation of that creation always touches me so deeply. And I mean, it generally brings me to tears. And, you know, when you're working with consciousness in this way, of course, you're immediately opening up transpersonal intergenerational content and irrespective of like the, the, the tool, right? I mean, ketamine is the only legal psychedelic medicine in, in America. I look forward to a time when, you know, I can kind of pick and choose. At this point, I, I kind of effort to be somewhat agnostic and really support the integration because otherwise it can just be sort of an amusement park ride for your mind and there's ancient figures dancing around and what does that mean? And, and how do we really, you know, create meaning around it and in a way that, that fuels more wholeness? So I, 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 I from my practice see that it, it immediately opens up that conversation for people and it's uh, a really it's a, it's a deep one thank you lauren don so the only thing that i was going to add to that joe is just really i mean you can see we're also very passionate about this I think, you know, your question was, what does the Western world um, have to learn from these ancient medicines and practices? And my answer is everything, because the, the, the Western worldview, I'm simplifying, but it just does not take into account expanded consciousness. And that's what these medicines do. They expand your consciousness. And if you have a really good person that you're working with, if you're lucky enough to have an actual shaman um, or are lucky enough to have a trained therapist who's journeyed him or herself, then that person understands expanded consciousness. The, I can tell you in my own training, the most difficult thing for me has been unlearning what I have learned. Pretty well everything in psychology speaks to the conscious mind other than these uh, nonverbal and body-based and artistic interventions that you mentioned earlier. And simply the ego is not listening. And that's the point to just calm down that ego so that an, an, an expanded consciousness can be heard. The consciousness of the mountains and the trees and the streams and frogs and bees. And that you cannot experience unless you've meditated a lifetime or you're a very highly evolved soul. So these medicines allow us to access that which we do not have and cannot experience 
in ordinary consciousness. So these are expanded consciousness studies for me. And you need, um, as was said earlier, someone who understands the cartography of the expanded consciousness or non-ordinary consciousness. That's my thoughts. <laughs> that was nice. Thank you, Don. Um, yeah, the expanded cartography is important and it's not super apparent when people come to the table. It's kind of a difficult conversation at times, um, but I think we're going to get there. Um, so here's a fun one. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> integration <laughs> doesn't necessarily have to just do with um, inner things. Like these tools are being integrated at many levels of our culture and society, um, including um, groups like DARPA, which is... Um, kind of a spin-off of the Pentagon. Uh, most of you are Canadian, so you don't pay money into DARPA too much, but some of us do. And they're, they're looking to redesign psychedelics without the trip. So um, like, do we need that mystical experience from the psychedelic compound for there to be healing? Like, I have my opinion, but I'd, I'd love to hear your opinions on this. It's my only point of reference. And I, I think we do need that experience. I think that the suffering that comes from experiencing oneself as separate needs to be treated in connection and in, and in relationship and experientially. So for me, like you can't create that in with some other technology, you know, it, it needs to be lived. And, you know, to follow up from the previous question and conversation, there's no doubt in my mind that ancient wisdom is the deepest technology that we have and that we need to, to access it. It's here. And, and, and there's, there's no replacement. Any other takers on this one? Yeah, you know, respectfully, I, I would not completely agree because I think there are levels of, of healing. So you may have a person who has suffered with uh, depression or anxiety and, and they don't want to take a journey. So certainly you can have, you don't have to have the mystical experience to expand consciousness, but if you microdose, for example, or you have a more uh, medically supported journey, all you really want to do is get rid of your anxiety or your debilitating depression. Um, you know, for some people, so, so I think the application in the Western world is more medicinal and corrective and oriented towards mental health problems. And I think that's fine. You won't have the mystical experience and your life won't necessarily change in the same way as if you did have a mystical experience. Um, but you might get rid of your anxiety or depression or OCD or whatever it is you're struggling with. So, so I think it's a hierarchy and a continuum and there are layers of, of healing depending on what one is ready for. Not everyone wants to have their consciousness expanded. That's all. I agree with you, John. I would just add, and not everyone's ready <laughs> to have their consciousness expanded. I think, um, you know, I really am a strong advocate that this isn't for everyone. Um, I think the, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a really interesting process, like why there's, I think in the traditional setting, like shamans will heal people. They, you know, traditionally people didn't actually have to ingest the medicine. Shaman would get the information, work with other plants and energetically, you know, they could do that work. Um, I think breath work is something that, can get people to similar places and might be a lot more of a safe entryway um, into kind of this extended state of consciousness. Um, but I think there's something about that, you know, if someone is kind of at a place where they're willing to kind of work with these medicines, I feel like there's something about that experiential component and really, you know, microdosing is a really good option or even with ayahuasca, it's like, okay, how can maybe someone just takes a little bit like homeopathic dose um, and so it's, I, I think that there could be something lost uh, if people are starting to push for that way. And then I also think that there's a lot of other options kind of, but I think certain people's ego structures are so strong that you need something to kind of open it up.
Um, and I also think it might be just an important side note to state that um, not every psychedelic experience is a mystical experience. And I think that's something, a conversation that I've had with a lot of uh, the people that have come to the retreat that I, I help facilitate is setting the expectation of you may have a, a hero's dose, you know, but that does not necessarily mean that you're going to have this mystical experience. So just kind of uh, uh, watching our wording on that potentially. Yeah. yeah. It's not a one-to-one -one thing. And I, I think a lot of these plants and drugs are very different, right? Like, you know, it's probably pretty safe to do this MDMA work and it gets a little more sketchy when we start moving up the um, <laughs> progress ladder. I don't really know the right phrase there, but I think y'all understand what I'm saying. Um, so next one here, psychedelics are often conceptualized as resetting or rebooting the brain. Do you think this is an accurate metaphor? And what role does integrative therapy play in healing and transformation that may follow from psychedelic journeys? How should we think about the dynamics of the integration process from start to end? And um, are we ever fully integrated? And wherever y'all want to go with that. <laughs> Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> um, I don't mind starting. Uh, I think the first thing that comes to mind is uh, is, is microdosing, right? It's not necessarily this giant reboot. I think certainly that can happen for a lot of folks when they take larger doses. But um, I so I more so work with the microdose, and I think instead of this huge, you know, coming back online, it's just it's an enlightening of of the senses. You know, I've had um, some people talk about how it turns down the volume on all that, that rumination, that back and forth of the critic or whatever that might be for an individual, right? And so even if it can just be these slight changes, these slight introductions to new ways of thinking, new ways of seeing or perceiving, uh, I think that has a huge benefit as well, right? Uh, but of course, I, I think there is the potential for that reboot. I've heard that we talked about, and I'm sure others here will, will have something to comment about that. Oh, can't hear you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, I can jump in. Sorry. Oh, Don, do you want to go? I, I just want to say again, for me, I really like to think in terms of a continuum rather than absolutes. You can have a mini reboot enough that you need so that you can. So for me, it's what do you want um, out of this? Do you want to change your life? Do you really want a, a, a pivot? Or do you want to just really enhance what's already going on? So again, I think it really, I think you can you reboot um, at, a, at, a, at a biological level, at a neuro, neuropsychological level and to make, and make changes, or you can make really big changes. It really depends if you had a really big trauma or a little trauma, it depends. So yes, there is absolutely rebooting. It's just a matter of degree and, and, and the current, mm -hmm studies are really looking at dose you can have you can have you know a good enough experience that's helpful to you with um, a, a small dose and others don't feel that at all and others really need a big dose so it looks it depends on what you're looking for is my kind of general view on that rebooting but oh absolutely you will reboot yeah mm. um i guess i feel like for me it opens up possibilities and so I don't know if it's rebooting and I don't know if that like feels right to me exactly. Um, but it's about, okay, there's now, so you were in this pretty fixed structure and now there's other possibilities and it's kind of opening us up to that. And so we have these uh, Tanya Komonen um, who has done a lot of work with integration. She talks about, we have this super highway, which is our <laughs> kind of what we're used to thinking, our neural pathways that we're used to going down. And then all of a sudden we get these little paths over here. And it's about the kind of care and attention to cultivate these other ways. Um, and I, I also come from a somatic perspective. And so for me, sometimes going slow is better. And you know, I think that people do make drastic big changes depending on what's going on in their lives. And there is kind of a ripple effect out, but um, yeah, it's about, okay, how do, we, how do we start to see things in a different way and kind of connect with other parts of our brain and other parts of our possibility. Mm. Yeah, thank you. 
Yeah, the rebooting analogy is funny for me. I spent so long in software that I, I want to see everything like totally powered down and like biological processes stop. So it's like NDE, like the real <laughs> reboot. Um, or like ketamine seems to be the one that seems to clo more closely mimic that. Um, you still got a little grain of consciousness there, but perhaps not as uh, intense a consciousness as psilocybin or a DMT type thing. Um, cool. Lauren, are you with us? Yes, I am. And my response to the question is that we're never fully integrated and that the destination really like is the journey and that it is an ongoing process. It is a continual unfolding and experiences that people can have the sense of really dissolving uh, their egoic attachments and, and their narratives around self in such a way that often facilitates a softening of their experience of themselves and gives them a deeper sense of what they're part of. And I just want to state as well that I very much agree not everybody needs a full-blown experience. I, I was saying before that there's no replacement for that. I, I may have misunderstood the question and I just want to say that like there's no th that is its own thing and you can't re replace that with anything else. Not everyone needs that. And, and every one of us is on like is in a process and, and the process is such a is, is beautiful and, and it, it's, it, it's, it's how we grow. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Integration should be a very long process onto death <laughs> and maybe beyond. Uh, we'll yeah. See. <laughs> um, yeah, great. So in an increasingly secular society where more people are disconnected from traditional spiritual and faith communities, what is the role of the psychedelic spiritual community in integration? And how do we create this community in a secular or non-denominational way? I've personally found it through breathwork, but I, I'm sure others have different methods and other things to say. Who wants to maybe jump in here first? Um, so one thing I, I do is I do a lot of work with Dr. Ido Cohen, who's based in the Bay Area with Integration Circle. And so we do a lot of online events. We actually have a, a series coming up around archetypes, um, which was mentioned earlier about exploring some of the big archetypes that come up in these processes. Um, but I think it's essential. It's absolutely essential because I think this is part of, so if we look at a lot of the mental health Kind of concerns that we're up against a lot of it is about environments it's about disconnection so disconnection from place disconnection from people disconnection from people that you can be kind of open with um, from ourselves kind of first and foremost and so i think that finding community along this pathway and so i think there's a lot of different people who are doing larger events out there um, you know where it is this is an example so maybe people will find a way to connect during this conference i know it's online um, but you know finding these spaces wherever that is that you can have people that can understand your experience because that's i think one of the big disagreeing disintegrating experiences for people is that they return to their lives and they don't have anyone to talk to uh, and i know uh dr adele lafrance is starting to work on that also within her studies is looking at the family system and how to also support that when people are using kind of these medicines which uh, i think is really quite i'm really excited to see what comes out of that. Mm. Yeah, I would love to stay uh, informed on her work on that. That'd be really cool. So if I can uh, kind of jump in and uh, um, present a, a, like a, 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 an additional perspective, because I guess because of the, the client clientele that I work with, I think if you want to deepen your your spiritual practice and in, increase your community, I think first and foremost, um, uh, the journey is an inner one. So I think it's very important that people remain open and receptive and invitational to developing a relationship with themselves and having a what they consider spiritual practice for themselves, even if it's just you know, contemplating for a few minutes or sitting in nature or meditating, whatever it is, I think. And then, you know, we were talking earlier about how like mycelium, your community will come to you. It's already there. You just can't see it. They'll just emerge if you are 
in harmony with yourself, if you are benefiting from the fruits of, of your journey. I, I, for me, I don't worry about finding my community. I, I, I believe that my community will find me or I will become aware of my community where I already live. I just don't have the eyes to see because I have not cultivated spiritual eyes yet. So for people taking this path, my recommendation would be start with yourself. That's my thought. Thank you, Don. Um, I don't have a fully formulated concept around this, but I do believe that we need some type of religion and we don't have one that really works anymore. Like the, I think that there's so, there's so little connection around like a spiritual practices. I mean, of course there, there are, are strong communities, but on a whole that has deteriorated and I think as humanity, we need ritual. We need we need connection. We need uh, the divine. And I don't know what that looks like now, but it's a question that I'm asking. And you know, even sitting in a Rosh Hashanah dinner last night, and like this is like the birthday of like the earth and like humans, and and that's the concept behind it. And to gather and to be creating meaning is important. And, and we need each other. Like it takes a village. The, the the concept of the nuclear family was like, you know, in the 1950s and the 1960s, it's, it's a new thing. And, and we we're meant to be in relationship and we, we need some sort of grounding elements. And I, I don't know what that looks like. Again, I, I said the concept isn't fully formed in my mind, but it is a question that I'm sitting with right now a lot. Hmm. I encourage a lot of people to start their own religion around this stuff um, easier in the States than a lot of places, but it's still possible quite anywhere. Uh, Robin. Um, yeah, I think I'll just add uh, briefly as to what everybody else was saying, but you know, what came to mind is even in that question, it was stated as a, a non-denominational or spiritual practice. And I think that we've shied away so much from the word religion for understandable reasons, right? Uh, but if we break down what that word even means, uh, like religion in, in Latin, it's to realign, right? And I think that a psychedelic experience is just that, it's a realignment. So I think if there is some kind of, I mean, why non-denominational? I understand why, but again, it's I don't have a, form, a formulated thought around this, but it's an interesting conversation to have, right? What, what do we need? I think we're definitely disconnected from our spiritual selves. So something new has to happen. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. We do need new forms of being with each other, new forms of relation. And, and Lauren, I love that point about nuclear families. It's, it's a big deal <laughs> and perhaps a big reason for a lot of our disconnection. Um, so let's see here. This is going to be a fun one. <laughs> the profundity of a psychedelic experience can leave the impression that one's work, spiritual or otherwise, is done. What is spiritual bypassing and how can psychedelic integration be harnessed to avoid this pitfall? All right, Don, can we start with you? <laughs> Um, I don't think it's ever done. I don't, e I'm not even familiar with that concept. It's never done. There is no beginning. There is no end. It's always a process and the present moment is all there is. And I, I just, I don't, I don't even understand the concept in, of being done. Done what? I, so I can't really contribute because it's just, it's just not even going into my brain. How can anyone think they're mm -hmm. done processing? Um, even, even in the traditional literature, even if you, you know, live in a mountain and become enlightened, you still have to return to the village. You still have to take a bath. You still have to make a living. You still have to live your ordinary. I, so for me, the, the best spirituality is in your activities of daily living. How do you treat other people? How do you treat your kids, your parents, your dog, your neighbors, your garden, your plants, all of that. It's really in the it's hidden in our daily lives for me. That's what I, cause I, I, it's my ego that took me out there and it was something else that brought me to the medicine. So I no longer trust anything that my ego directs me to, uh, including uh, community. I just trust that community will come to me if I 
live my life in a, in, in a way that is in harmony with what I have learned in my journeys and continue to learn. And it's been a very long time, but it's constant for me. So I can't contribute in any other way, Joe. Sorry. No worries. It sounds like an integrated spirituality. Thank you. I think the psychedelic world and psychedelic community has the potential to be a massive bridge in what was and is and what can be. And I believe as well that there is a great deal of spiritual bypassing and a sense of just, oh, we're la la la, one, one, one. That's true, yes. And that's not the reality that we live in. And, you know, even I'm happy that this is a female panel, but it's like, you know, like very white presenting. And I'm aware of that. Like I'm aware of the pitfalls that are part of like, the society that we live in and and that there's a huge opportunity for us to like really really like excavate what's real such that we can build something new and you know there's a, there is a lot of bypassing and you know i mean my heart is beating quickly just like saying this because it's uncomfortable and i'm uncomfortable but we get to like leverage and 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 give time to these profound experiences in such a way that they really support like a bigger collective shift and you know for me i'm i i'm a white woman and i'm also like seeking to learn to unpack my own like stuff to partner like you know rep you know, competency isn't enough we need representation and we need we need we have a lot of work to do and uh, I, I believe that spiritual bypassing is very much a real thing in the psychedelic space. And I believe that um, psychedelics and psychedelic medicine uh, in, a, in a good way can be an incredibly powerful tool to get us where we need to go. Mm -hmm. um, I might also just take it uh, one step back and <clears throat> for maybe viewers who don't know what spiritual bypassing is. Um, it is a tendency to use spiritual ideas and practices to sidestep or avoid facing unresolved emotional issues, psychological wounds, and unfinished developmental tasks. Um, in my experience, I, I've, I find this topic actually also quite activating because uh, being in the wellness space, I, I, I notice actually a lot of this, uh, you know, from, from yoga studios to, to different retreats, perhaps. Um, this idea that I, I'm done the work, it's done. And I find it, how I've observed it at this point is it's kind of a defense mechanism. Um, it might look, you know, a little bit prettier than other defense mechanisms, but at the end of the day, it saves, it, it's the same purpose to avoid what's going on there, to, you know, disconnect us from our feelings and not really look at the big picture. And it's more about checking out than actually checking in. And I think a lot of people have a really hard time identifying when they're actually going through this because it's an avoidance technique, right? So I do think that this um, needs to be talked about more, I think just so that we can recognize it within ourselves and within, within others and to you know compassionately try holding them accountable to that because it can be really harming. I've, I've had clients you know, feel shamed out of um, some circles that they've been in, some integration circles because for example, everyone's had this beautiful experience maybe from a psychedelic journey, but psychedelic journeys aren't exclusively beautiful and wonderful. They can also be very difficult. They can be very gritty, right? And so people who are sitting there being like, oh, like everybody is, is only talking about the love and the light and the positivity that's come of this. Like, should I share this? Right? So I definitely think it's something that we, we need to talk about more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I appreciate what everyone's been saying. And um, yeah, I think it's a big kind of issue in the, I also appreciate Robin, you defining it, the spiritual bypassing. I think that's really helpful for everyone. Um, and I think that part of the question was around how can integration support with it? You know, we all have our blind spots. <laughs> and so I think having another person there with you, you know, if you're working, if you're talking about relational integration, you know, it's a very personal process as well. Uh, can help you check out. It's like, oh, maybe someone doesn't actually know they're disassociating or avoiding something or going away from the discomfort, whatever that is. And once again, these usually this disassociation has a purpose. And so to have kind of the support there with it, um, 
can be really, really positive um, in terms of just to have that resource. Maybe that's, you don't have that internal resource, but maybe you need someone to kind of help work through that. Um, and then I think, yeah, just having these more difficult conversations about like, what is the intention around using these medicines? A lot of people I see just want to feel better, which if you're, if you're in a lot of pain, you're having a really hard time. Yeah, I get that. And that's really real. Um, and then it's also about, okay, well, are you ready to actually do some of the more difficult work? Are you ready to be with the discomfort? And if the answer is no, that's okay. But I think people should be having these conversations in the assessment period, you know, if they're thinking about using these medicines. And I, I also really loved on what you said, because um, that for me is becoming more and more my, my litmus papers. How am I behaving at home? <laughs> How am I treating my dog? I have a, a two and a half year old. How am I treating my daughter? How's my garden doing? You know, these kind of questions. It's about, okay, like, how do we, you know, so this idea about is integration ever done? I personally don't think so. <laughs> I don't even know what that would look like. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I really, I'm really glad that this was part of the conversation. And so I think integration, especially in relationship, can be having someone to kind of point back our, our blind spots. Because a lot of, you know, what I've seen in many years of working with people is that even some of these spiritual practices can be used as a way to disassociate. So meditation is a prime example. It's like people just check out and that's okay. You know, some meditation techniques are about, okay, connecting with the body, finding space around the discomfort. Um, but it's really about how the person interprets that and how they use those tools. So um, yeah, once again, I think this could be a very long, <laughs> juicy conversation. But I'm, I'm really glad. I, I agree this is something that needs to be talked about more often because psychedelics aren't easy. Uh, and then I think eventually part of the intention is to have those difficult ceremonies where you get in touch with that pain or the fear or the shame or the disgust or whatever that is that, you know, was too much to be with when you're younger. And sometimes the, those medicines, that's part of what they can do is have that holding. Uh, and hopefully a good therapist as well can give you some of that holding to kind of work through it again and then to integrate it, to take some of that charge away. Mm, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think it's really important that we give the listeners or viewers a little bit of an idea of what we might be excited about in terms of um, the techniques that might have been helpful in psychedelic integration uh, for you. Like, there's probably a thousand techniques you could work with, but is there anything any of you are excited about right now? It seems like our culture is really, thankfully, I think is starting to really dig this somatic approach. So Hakomi, somatic experiencing, all the, all the rest. Like, I think that's really fantastic. Um, Don, you came off mute, so I'll let you jump in. Um, so I think um, I, I think you have to enter into this work through your body. So you, so I 100% support body work um, and energy work. It's essential and the diet and the preparation in very um, sacred ways. That's because it is sacred medicine. And um, but it is like everything else being adapted for you know. Uh, Western use. So one of the things that I find most exciting is in, in, in the way that body-based therapies, nonverbal interventions and energy work is being integrated into psychedelics. So is the cognitive um, domain. And that is um, some very, very different ways of working with people, understanding their um, non-ordinary expanded consciousness and having a way to communicate that and integrate that in, in therapy in a cognitive way. As part of the you know, clinical trials, we can't do energy work, we can't do body, we can't even talk about that stuff. Um, but I have to say that the, the, the training we get is exceptional in, in accessing information from expanded consciousness, bringing it back into your daily life teaching you how to notice the changes because changes are going on, but you may not notice because we live our lives on automatic. Everything is so habitual. So 
Um, so yeah, so change can happen, but you also have to notice that change can happen because it can be sub perceptual. If you, if you, you have to know what you're looking for is my point. So it's not all that well known because it is, um, it is part of the compass studies, but there are some extraordinarily exciting changes happening in the cognitive, uh, interventions for psychedelic assisted therapy. I'm very happy. I'm very excited about that. Yeah. Thank you, Don. Uh, I think some tools that, you know, anybody can use themselves if they're looking to, you know, have a safe experience as safe as possible. Um, as I've mentioned before is, uh, is including the arts. I mean, that can be anything from creative writing and to journaling what your intention is beforehand, you know, what you're hoping to get out of this experience. And then the after, writing down what happened after, or again, getting a piece of paper and a marker or paint and just, you know, it's just expressing it in some way that isn't just, I don't know, theory and analyzing and all these things, but just feeling that experience and, uh, and working through it in a creative way, I think is something that almost anybody can do. I would argue anybody can do. And so, yeah, for folks who are just looking for some, uh, easy integration tools. That's what I would recommend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, this reminds me of um, Dr. Stan Groff's holotropic breath work. Like there's the expanded cartography, there's the art, there's the body work. And perhaps that's a book some folks should check out, holotropic breath work. Um, who wants to jump in next? I'd like to add the importance of relationship. And that for me with my private practice, the integration begins well before the journey and it's setting the groundwork being really prepared like understanding why you're doing this you may have a very diff different experience than than what you expect but like kind of being very intentional not only within your own personal like ecosystem but also within the space of of who, who am i with you know i i tell my clients all the time you hire me and and you can fire me whenever you want. <laughs> like I, I, I really work within an empowerment model to, to really activate a person's individual authority, to encourage them to set their own boundaries. I want every client that I work with to feel safe with me, to trust me, so that they can let go into the experience in a good way. That doesn't mean that it's going to be easy or comfortable, but that whatever comes up there, they know that they're held. And the integration, you know, I, like I said, begins, 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 begins before it begins. But in the immediate aftermath, taking such good care of a person, right? Ketamine is such a powerful psychedelic medicine, especially in its, you know, higher doses. And, you know, with my clients, I take a lot of notes when they're, when they're, you know, coming out of it a lot. And, and I share them with them. It's a real labor of love on my part. And they reflect back and can use some of the visuals and experiences, which they might have forgotten to, to fuel their meditation practices, to, you know, bring them to like dance to nineties music in their living rooms, to, you know, create art, to have hard conversations with their loved ones, to, you know, do all kinds of different uh, things that essentially allow them to train what I call the upload right? Like we get information and the integration happens when we follow, follow it. And, and, and really people are just doing their own work. Like you can lead a horse to water. You can't make a drink. You know, when they're in that like space and place with themselves, people's like inner healing capabilities, their own like deep inner wisdom is turned on. And how do they move that forward? How do they, like stay in their authentic selves? How do they stay transparent? And it bears mentioning, I work with my father as my primary prescribing physician, in my ketamine assisted psychotherapy practice. And I believe that all work is family work and we belong to one human family. That, that is true. And, 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 you know, families can be complicated, <laughs> you know, families can get messy. And I was, you know, with my father, always very, very transparent about the psychedelic work that I was doing. And but I mean, personally, and my dad came from a context of drugs are bad. All drugs are bad. Um, smoked pot a few times in the seventies, didn't like it. Doesn't drink alcohol. And, you know, he was a hard no. And I didn't, you know, hide my experiences from him because he didn't understand them. 
And I didn't like stay quiet because, you know, he didn't have the, the, the wherewithal to understand what I was thinking about. I just kept sharing. I kept inviting him like to read and learn. And, and, you know, I mean, now my dad is like such a psychonaut and like beautifully committed to psychedelic science and medicine. And, and, and this is a physician like who's mainstream, like part of the by the, the by we avoid the bypassing by having the conversations with our loved ones, even when they're hard. So integration to me, it's, it's so relational. Like it's, it's with my dad and it's with each and every one of my clients. So integration is supported for me within the context of relationship and being like judicious from your own, like kind of biochemistry, like who am I attracted to? Do I trust this person? Are they trained? Are they safe? Like before you dive in. And I'm excited about that part. I'm excited about relationship. Mm. Um, yeah. Thank you for naming that Lauren. And I mean, a lot of even traditional therapy, there's so many studies that relationship is one of the key factors beyond modalities. And so, I mean, I don't see why anyone wouldn't apply that to the psychedelic realm. Um, and it's, I get a lot of kind of clients that approach me and they say, oh, I'm curious about working with psychedelics or plant medicines. Can we talk about that? And that's one of the key things I mentioned. It's like, okay, is around how do you feel even in your interactions with people? You know, I don't refer people to places, but it's like, how do you feel if you're reaching out to someone um, in terms of, do you feel safe with them already? Do you feel like there's some kind of, how's the communication? Are you able to ask questions? You know, some people say, oh, I don't want to talk about my training. I don't want to talk about certain things. It's like, those are all really important questions and hopefully people feel empowered to ask them. Um, so I think the relational component is is huge. And I think that's where also the experiential component can be really critical kind of in, in this work. And then in terms of other tools, uh, I really echo the somatic um, approach. Uh, I'd also give a shout out to Dr. Gabor Mate's Compassionate Inquiry. Um, it's quite good in terms of helping people to really identify the belief systems, how that shows up in the body, um, and trying to kind of grill back to some of those like earlier conditions that, that created, you know, what they're dealing with in the present. Um, and then just from a traditional perspective, you know, a lot of the energetic work that the Shipibo healers do is that they look at people's body and they see where the energies are stuck. So where there's these blockages. So from, you know, in Shipibo it's rate or they translate it into Spanish as susto. So where people have had these shocks in their lives um, where they've either closed down, they've disconnected from their spirit, uh, they've had things um, that just have gotten shut down. So in their kind of framework, how it's been explained to me is they get energy moving again. So they start to work to get things moving. So I think what Don and Robin were also saying in terms of just these processes and ways in terms of getting things moving. So drawing, dancing, art, this kind of somatic, um, putting attention in different levels, you know, yoga, I think also can be a really good tool in this. So whatever it is to kind of get things going and moving and stay kind of um, having the, that kind of energy moving through the body. So whatever that, that looks like for people. Great. Um, <laughs> does anybody know if we have another half hour, or are we almost um, done here? I just want to be mindful of time. I think we have 20 minutes and I'm, cool. I'm curious, there's a lot of comments happening in the side. I mean, I'm not looking in I'm depth. I'm pulling but those up now. Yeah. I'm working from the top down. There's a lot of people talking about privilege um, mm. and kind of how spiritual bypassing relates to that. And so I don't know if that's something that people want Go for to it. Let's have you take a step at that. Um, anyone? Go down. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, now that I understand what spiritual bypassing is, I, I agree. It certainly sounds to me like a, a, a bit of sense. And my, my own approach to to working with someone that, that that is presenting me with a defense is to my personally I just remain very deeply respectful of that I don't call them out I don't blow their defense we need our defenses for me it's a signal that this this is the level of expansion that they're at and I don't have any business stretching them further so um, I just I just kind of leave that alone and you know when 
when someone says, well, oh, I'm done now, I'm enlightened now, I've, or I've finished my interview. I personally have never heard it. So um, that's why I was unfamiliar with it. So I, I, I would remain respectful of that I, until they themselves, see, I, I really think this is an, an inner self-directed journey. And I think it is a very Western way of even taking a look at these journeys. The expert is not anyone outside the person that the healer is inside of you. And that's why it's really important to connect with yourself before you connect with anyone else. We had a brief conversation about attachment before. Attachment starts to happen at a neuro, neurological level before you're even born. Attachment is the key to everything, not just our relationships with people, but our relationship with our environment. And so I think we all have attachment issues when we're so disconnected with our, our earth and we harm the earth. So if someone wants a spiritual bypass, it's I'm okay with that. Just sit with that for a little while and see what emerges. In the meantime, draw, paint, dance, go to yoga, meditate, talk, connect with people, and something will emerge in a very gentle internal way that will make you think, you know, I really lost my cool. Maybe I'm not done. So for me, it's very important that you look through at your life through your own eyes and come to it. I personally would get defensive if someone called me out on something that I wouldn't, I'm not yet ready to face consciously. See, that's the other thing that these processes are, are at a completely level, different level of consciousness, perhaps even in different dimensions and different times. It's so complicated. But when we start to talk about it with our conscious mind, we immediately constrain it and reduce it to something like, well, what can I do? Well, there are some suggestions. You've had some lovely suggestions. You can paint, you can draw, you can dance, you can sing, you can garden, you can meditate. There's lots to do. But what you should do is go inside of yourself, not outside. The, the days of having gurus outside of ourselves are done for me. That's the spiritual path. It's a very self-directed internal path. There are guides, but you also have to look at the guides in a very critical way. And that's why I say why I'm devoted to the medicines. It's not for everyone. It's not for everyone's path. And yeah, so those are my thoughts. Great. Thank you. I think um, yeah. Sorry. Do you want to go, Robert? You go ahead. Okay. Um, I think of what, like, what I was seeing in the the comments um, was kind of as a movement, this, or kind of the danger of, you know, psychedelic experiences when people have that experience of oneness or, you know, that we're all connected. You know, that's that's a beautiful gift. And I think when we kind of come back to the three D reality, I think people use that as a way to bypass kind of privilege. Is what I was seeing in the discussion. And so, um, yeah, I, I guess I just fully, I agree with that. <laughs> um, because when we come back to this reality, there is a lot that's, you know, has to be had with our, you know, our gender, our race, our class, our personal power, all of these things influence how we can show up in this world or how we can't show up in this world. Um, and then, I mean, that's some of the, the things we can start to think, renegotiate through these medicines. Um, but as a community, I think it's pretty dangerous um, because it's it doesn't honor these different histories that people have had and their ancestors have had in order to put them here in this moment. So um, I think that's one of the, the kind of shadow sides of, of this scene, I don't know, movement, whatever you want to call it, um, and conversations that we can continue to have. Shadow side of psychedelia. Mm. Oh, it's big. <laughs> Robin? Um, yeah, so I guess the, the part that I do want to add is uh, I, I actually do work with a lot of uh, Canadian immigrants, I guess, because I am a, a biracial woman myself with a Hispanic background. And something that I do notice, you know, the people that are called to me, they are obviously also interested in the more transpersonal and psychedelic side of psychotherapy and 
there is, you know, the, the idea of oneness has come up before in some of these integration circles. And I was also tuning into uh, a BIPOC and psychedelics webinar in which some of the people in this community feel like there is, of course, a sense of oneness when you experience psychedelics. But as was mentioned earlier, when you come back down to earth, there, there is a break in that they might not feel like, OK, sure, but I don't actually feel like I am part of this community in some way. Right. And again, coming back to the shame that they might feel because of that and they don't really feel like or, or they're experiencing, can I fully participate? Do I really feel one with this group? And so, you know, to answer kind of to weave in one of the questions from the queue here, which is how do we uh, tailor facilitation and integration sessions to clients with different cultural and social backgrounds? Um, I think it's twofold. It's creating the space. Uh, for individuals in the BIPOC community to facilitate that themselves and to have a space specifically tailored and designed for those community members so that they do feel like there is a safe space for them to explore and connect with maybe someone who has shared some of those uh, experiences when it comes to racial injustice or you know uh, difficulties with the immigration process is something that comes up a lot with within my work. Um, and the second part to that is how to tailor the integration sessions with uh, different backgrounds is you have to follow the lead of the client that's in the room, right? We are not an expert on you. You are the expert on you. You have a wealth of wisdom within within you, and it's our jobs to help uh, you hear that voice. So I think that's that's as much as I think I can contribute in that. I'd like to jump in and answer some of the questions as well. Um, so absolutely activism can be a form of integration and a beautiful one at that. I, I love that question. And, you know, someone might be awakened to a, a cause through an experience that then they get to really practice being part of a solution with in, in direct service. As well, there was a question about people who abuse psychedelics. And that is, a, of course, people can be addicted to anything. And I would say that in the, the family of psychedelic things, ketamine is probably one of the more highly abused. And uh, personally, before I started working with it within a psychotherapeutic context, I saw a lot of people abusing ketamine. And it was painful for me to watch and it scared me a little bit. I, you know, when people are engaging with some sort of recreational context, you know, the highest like form of it in my mind is to create more connection, not disconnection. And, you know, I also have a great deal of compassion for people who feel that they need to leave, who feel that what is happening here is not okay. And that engage with, you know, any sort of addictive process in order to leave. Uh, that being said, you know, my commitment to the larger movement of decriminalization is in order to bring medicine to people who can benefit from it in a good way, and as well to support people who need, you know, help in, in addictive processes without the stigma. So are these tools being abused? Absolutely. We're still human here. And, you know, how can we, you know, manage the different kind of iterations and challenges uh, responsibly and safely and, and kindly is, is my greatest concern. I'd want a firm definition on abuse, but yeah, something that would put somebody in a hospital is probably a good edge, at least. Um, yeah, thank you, Lauren. Anybody else want to jump on that one? Like I, ideas around abuse in this stuff, like ayahuasca, when I see abuse someone go 500 times, like I get a little nervous. I'm like, what are you really getting from it at a certain point? Like, sorry, Don, go ahead. Uh, no, I, I think that I was just going to say that abuse can uh, occur at many levels in many different ways. Um, so my my own view, and I think probably the view of most of us here, is that these are sacred medicines and those that guard the sacred plants, it's their duty to make sure that, you know, that, that, that the people that come to benefit from the gifts of this medicine um, basically are prepared and ready and worthy. This is not a commercial venture. This is a sacred journey that people take. It's not, I mean, I realize that there has have to be funds exchanged, but not everything can be monetized. 
and monetizing the sacred is, I think adopting these medicines is one thing from a medical point of view to benefit millions and millions of people. But um, yeah, my, my own view is that it's a, the, the people that guard the plants need to, need to make those decisions uh, around uh, the nature of the abuse in so many ways. Yeah. Who do you think those guardians are? Like regulators those or that doctors? Call, those that are called to the medicine, they know who they are. They know who they are. Um, when they're called to the medicines, the, the teachers, the healers, they come from all over the world. They, you know, they can be in corporate uh, lives and, and, and be called. When I'm talking abuse, I'm talking about the abuse of the land and the plant and the peoples who have been the traditional healers. Um, you know, in terms of communicating this in, in Canada, there was uh, some year, years, maybe one or two years ago, the indigenous people in British Columbia um, had sacred land and they did not want yet another ski resort built on their land and they went to court and um, the judges that made the decision did not understand the indigenous language in relationship to the earth. They said, this mountain is our grandfather. You can't put ski hills on it. And the judges unanimously did not agree that the uh, mountain was a church. That's a disconnect in language, because certainly that mountain was the grandfather of that, that land. But something is lost in, in translation. So the indigenous people that live on the land, they must guard the land. And those of us who understand that um, or believe it, not everyone believes it, but those of us that get it, not everyone does. And this is not coming from a superior point of view. I'm just, this is, this is like, those of us that get it, we have to, we have to work with the translation of the language to understand. I mean, it was in the 1960s and, and even in the early 70s that we were taking our indigenous people and putting them in reform school. And it took a lot of language and growth and education and healing and communication and disruption and objecting and understanding to come to the point that, oh my God, look, look what we did. And, we have to make it better. So that's what I'm saying about the abuse. It, 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 it just, we're human. It just goes in, in all directions. And that's why for me, I mean, how I treat my eggplant, that girl, how I do this is how I do that, right? How I care for my plants is how I care for my family, how I care for my, my clients, my patient, my community, my that. And I think for me, that's what, what is like, uh, again, abuse. Like for me, everything else, it, it exists on a continuum. If I don't water my plant, it bothers me. For me, I won't abuse my plant. I'm very conscientious about watering my plant in a very ritual kind of way. I do that. It's my Sunday morning church routine. So I think I've said enough. Please. Thank you, Don. Anybody else want to jump in? Yeah, I, I really appreciate what you just said, Dawn. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's once again, it's like this translation is about worldviews in a way. Um, and so I, I think there's two kind of conversations. There's one about abusing substances and people's relationship with it. And then I think there's also this deeper conversation around if we are working with these medicines and this is part of the, the translation issue, I think is that, okay, it's like, how do we translate people who have a deep spiritual practice and a relationship with all beings and maybe the, the essence is, okay, how do I not cause harm for myself and for future generations versus, you know, if that's the decision-making process versus um, how do I get the most money <laughs> or capital, whatever that is, if it's primary resources out of this choice. And so I think there's kind of a, a conflict that's happening there. Um, and so the more and more we can start to kind of include that and you know i think that would also be including different voices in this conversation as well um, would be beneficial and also i think it's a really good conversation as we work with these medicines that do have indigenous roots what does that look like you know what does it mean to have permission to work with that medicine what does it mean to have permission to you know what what's the the cultural context that holds that medicine and you know if we don't study in that context what's the repercussions of that you know what are we dealing with and then I think there's also the issue of, you know, there's of people around abusing substances. Um, and I think that's really personal. And I don't really know what the answer is to that. You know, it's like, 
people have their path and they're going to do with what they want with their path. You know, I made some stupid choices earlier in my life for sure. And, you know, is that, was that a mistake in the moment? Maybe I thought it was longer term, maybe not. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's also about kind of a longer term perspective in terms of, of these things. But I think for me, it comes down to uh, a lot around intention. So what's your intention with using this? And I mean, Joe, you said you let a, something about recreational use of psilocybin. So, I mean, if that's your intention, that's your intention. I think the context of a conversation today and where integration comes in is when people are using these substances for healing. And I think there's a big, big difference there. And then in terms of abusing in the recreational sense, like that's, I think that's just a personal judgment based on what someone's doing, so. Yeah, thank you. Lauren, Robin, you wanna jump in on this one? I don't think I have anything to, to add personally. I think it was uh, very well said by Don and Deanna. Thank you. Yeah, great. I, I just, yeah, I guess I just wanted to just say, uh, when I was talking about abuse, I was talking about abuse as a construct or as a worldview. So it, you cannot, you, you, if you're, so I agree with you, like who, who can say what it, what is abuse? If you want to journey, go journey. I'm not going to judge you if this is what you need to do sooner or later, things will, will, will change in my, in your life. So I was talking about as a, a construct about how you were, view the, view the world um, uh, along with healing. That's also a construct. I think I made the point earlier for someone to get rid of their anxiety is enough for their personal healing, given their life journey. But someone else may really be called to have a peak experience. So I think we're having, you know, it's kind of a bit of a paradox. We're having an ego-based conversation about non-egoic processes, and we're translating them back into language and egoic processes. So I, I just, I find language very interesting because these ideas are, are constructs. So if, if you're the type of person that self-harms, you're probably gonna, you know, well, maybe some people internalize, some people externalize. So you're gonna either abuse things outside of yourself or you're gonna abuse in, things inside of yourself in your body if, you, if that construct is active, if that energy is active in you. That was my point. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Lauren? I guess like one, one of the, it, back to relationship, it's how, how do we be in this space of like, of contribution, of like connection in a good way versus like extraction and domination? And like, how do we live to, like together, shoulder to shoulder, heart to heart, eye to eye with the medicine, right? Like, there's so many people are like, you know, the, the grab for entheogens, like the commercialization, the like, you know, money that's like being poured in like good, let's put use resources to work to, you know, support widening access in an ethical way. But I, I think that it's really important to maintain like an intention as, as people participating in, in this work and in this larger conversation around service and Doing this in in a in a good and in, in a good way for everyone's like health and wellness, you know, it's like I think that it touches on the question of obviously abuse and as well as, like the social justice conversation that we need to be in, in a space of like dominion versus domination and contribution versus extraction. And even you know, I've been invited people having like a mushroom, like talk to the mushroom, like at, like be at, what can you do for it, not just like. What can I get from you? It's called psilocybin. Like maybe it's got a name. You know, can you be in relationship? <laughs> That's wonderful. <I> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Relational process. Yeah. It's great. Um, well, it looks like we're at time, um, but that was a really great time. So I want to thank you all for, for tuning in. Uh, remind you that you can donate to the conference below using the donate button that contributes to really interesting psychedelic research that's happening. Um, and yeah, thank you, Deanna Rogers, Don DeCuna, 
Lauren Taus and Robin Bannister for joining us. It was really fun. And uh, <laughs> hope we get to link up at another conference in the future, maybe in real space. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Thank you, everyone. And, Thank um, you. We're going to break right now for a lunch break, and we're going to come back at 1 p.m. for the, the next panel, Psychedelics Beyond the Clinic. So we'll see you all then. <laughs>